and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm Yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living living hope. I don't know about y'all, but man, last week was amazing with Resurrection Weekend and celebrating how much Jesus came to love us, to show us that he was with us and that he'd never leave us and that his resurrection was then promised to live in us and through us so that it would then extend into the generations to come. And it's reached us even here today. So church, thank you so much for joining us here at Anastasia Church Elkton. We're so excited that you're with us. And we just wanna say thank you for coming back. And maybe some of this is your first time. And if you're a guest with us, man, we'd love to connect with you. If there's something that you'd like to share with us, whether it's a prayer request or you'd like more information about Anastasia Church Elkton and how to be a part, maybe even join or, or be baptized, Whatever that decision might be, we want to draw your attention to connectcard.anastasiachurch.org. 
It's there that you'll be able to click on Anastasia Church Elkton, and you'll be able to give us some of that information that we'd love to then contact and reconnect with you as well. Also, if you're looking for a place to really feel like, you know what, hey, I know these people. They're a part of my family. It's somebody that I can talk to, somebody that even, even sheltered at home, even feeling isolated, that you can be a part of a life group. We would love for you to email Elkton at anastasiachurch.org and connect with us as a church and be connected in a small group called a life group that we'd love for you to be a part of. I mean, there's so many things going on. I don't know about you, but I'm gearing up for something I hear that's going to be happening on Wednesday, April 29th. It's a worship night. It's all Anastasia worship teams coming together to worship Lord, to give him praise. And that's going to be Wednesday night, April 29th at 630. And you'll need to go to our Facebook pages to see that in order to be a part of that premiere worship night together as we praise the Lord. So you know what? I think we need to greet each other. I think we need to come together. I think we need to let everybody know that, you know what? Hey, we might be at home, but we can be excited that we're at church together. So what I want you to do is I want you to kind of give one of like, you know, something fun, you know, maybe even like, you know, something like that. You know, give me a sprinkler, all right? Give something like that. Or, you know, you can give it a little, uh-huh, yep. Oh, oh yeah. Come on, come on. I, the sound guys right now are just, they're just doing this. So whatever that is, I mean, you know, whatever, you know, whatever that thing is in your heart, give it to somebody in your house. Let them know the love of Jesus. We're so thankful that you're with us. And thanks again for being with us here at NSA's Church Upton. Bye.
Heavenly Father, I just thank you that right now, through all the craziness that's going on, that we can keep our eyes on you and that we can truly say it is well, it is well with our soul. Thank you so much for your protection and your love during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Howdy. So, we finished our series, Show and Tell. I don't know what I liked more. Was it the showing? Was it the telling? I don't know. But now we're into a brand new series, and that's going to be Raw, Psalms Speaking to Mental Health. A lot of connotations with the word raw. It's, uh, you know, that chicken is raw. And it's never raw unless you got some psychopath cooking for you. It's like undercooked. Uh, that sushi is raw. I don't think anyone ever says that. Uh, those dance moves are raw. I think kids used to say that, and now they say something like, that's fi, or I don't know what they say anymore. I'm almost 50. But uh, you can be emotionally raw, and that's happens to me quite often. And then I can feel raw because of my anxiety. Because of my anxiety, I oftentimes feel very raw. Uh, Mason gave me three topics to potentially talk on. And as soon as he said anxiety, I was like, yes, I am actually an expert in not dealing with anxiety very well. I'm an expert at dealing with anxiety in some very unhealthy ways. And then thanks to Jesus Christ coming into my life, I learned how to cope with anxiety in a much healthier fashion. So that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. So when I think about anxiety, uh, I think of a version of me sitting at a bar at an airport. And I'm, I'm looking at the clock on the wall and I know that time is continuing to progress and I will be at some point getting on an airplane and that airplane is going to take off and I am going to be flying through the air at 30,000 feet, 600 miles per hour in a carton, almost like I'm an egg in a carton flying through the air. Terrified me. So what would I do with my anxiety? I would take my anxiety and I would push it down, 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 deep into my stomach and I would pour beer on top of it. That's literally what I would do. I was afraid that my anxiety was something that other people could not only hear, but they could see. And so I would push it down and I would try and drown it with beer. But that doesn't work. It doesn't work. It fails miserably. Kind of like if your neighbors are making a lot of noise and you try to put a pillow over your head, you know, you can still hear it. It doesn't really help. So I kicked it up a notch. And I think that's the general trajectory of people that are abusing alcohol. I went to a doctor and I was prescribed medication so I could take that pill before the flight. And there on the prescription, it read for anxiety. Couldn't be that bad, right? So I took one, but I was on a flight with my family and I took a pill and I was asleep from the time we took off until we landed. And I woke up and you would think you could put that in the success story, right? Not so much. I felt like I had somehow failed as a father because I wasn't there for them. What if they needed me, right? What if they needed me and I wasn't there for them? So I had to do something, I had to change. About three months after that event, I gave my life to Jesus Christ and I was flying. I was getting ready to, to get on a flight. And uh, I was sitting there, you know, and I had my little pill in my palm. I'd given up alcohol. You know, I, I quit drinking alcohol. Um, but this pill, you know, it just really felt like something different. It felt different. It wasn't alcohol. It was prescribed by a doctor. And in fact, I only took it when I was getting ready to fly. So I sat there with it and I realized I realized that I needed to give this up. Reading Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. 
See, the problem was I was trying to deal with the anxiety. I was trying to help it. I thought this little pill could help me. And instead of giving it to God, I thought I could deal with it. So again, I sat with that little pill in my hand. I bowed my head and I prayed. And I would like to do that with you right now. Lord, this pandemic, um, it, it's, it's like it's grabbed us and it has shaken us. And I wonder what's going to be left after, you know, when we get to go about our daily routine, because I know that people stuck at home, cooped up together, don't always cope with their anxiety extremely well. I know that there are young people right now who are thinking about coping with anxiety in ways that are not healthy. Uh, drugs and alcohol. And I know that there are parents, there are elders, there are guardians, there are mentors in these houses that are supposed to be watching young people and they're doing the same thing. I just pray, God, that we can learn to, to cope with our anxiety in a healthy fashion. And that is just give it to you, God. Thank you, Lord, for giving us what we need. And that is we can become the best versions of ourselves when we lean into you, when we give our lives to you. For all these things in your name, Lord, amen. I wouldn't want to refer to myself as wicked. That, is, that doesn't seem like an accurate title for me. Um, I mean, I was really only hurting myself, right? And how many people have you heard uh, with issues with drugs and alcohol say, I'm only hurting myself? Yeah, well, I would like to talk about someone who handled anxiety extremely well, um, and that is young David who wrote most of the book of Psalms. So we're gonna be looking at Psalms 37 verses one through five, but first I wanna give you a little backstory when it comes to, to uh, David and who he is. Before we read, let's talk about who wrote this. So David was a shepherd sleeping underneath the stars, weathering storms. What did he know about anxiety? Did you hear what I just said? David was a boy sleeping under the stars, fighting off coyotes and wolves and wild dogs. He's a boy trying to fight off all these animals. Uh, when I was clickety-click typing this sermon, a storm came through St. John's County uh, Monday, and the lightning and the thunder was so bad I went inside. I was in a covered, screened in porch, safe, and I still went inside. David was a boy and had no place to hide when, you know, he was beneath the elements. What did he know about stress? What did he know about anxiety? A lot. So Samuel is being tasked by God to find a new king because Saul has really turned his back um, on the Lord. So God uh, motivates Samuel to show up at the house of Jesse and Jesse's got eight sons. Oh, that poor mother, right? Eight sons. And so when Samuel walks through the door, he sees Eliab and Eliab is this great looking kid and he's tall and he's twisted steel and a crown is gonna look amazing on him. And Samuel's like, hey God, we found our guy. And God's like, no, that's not our guy. He's like, really? Oh, he would have looked so good in a crown. You're not the one. Go on. He does this with six other sons. And then finally, Samuel looks at Jesse and he's like, you got any more? And uh, Jesse's like, yeah, I got David, shepherd out in the field watching sheep. That's the guy. David's the guy. And he is, in fact, going to become king because here's the point. If you feel alone and you feel unappreciated, all you need is God. And as long as God loves you, he owns and rules everything, you're going to be all right. So I always like to give a little backstory, right? But here is Psalm 37, verses one through five, and let's read. Uh, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. 
Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. See, Psalm 37 is basically how all things work. It's contrast creating definition. All things work like that. This is hard. This is soft, right? That's how it works. So in Psalm 37, one through five, we've got what is good versus what is wicked. Uh, the, I believe that we please or disappoint the Lord with our actions. I believe we do that. And when you trust in the Lord and you do good and you dwell in the land and you befriend faithfulness, things are gonna go extremely well for you because you are pleasing God. Where I think we get tripped up in in reading these verses is in taking them actually literally, a literal interpretation of them. Like if I am just patient and I do what God wants me to do, he is going to chop down my detractors. He is going to chop them down left and right. And if I am patient and I bide my time, in six verses, we have uh, verse 11, and that is the very famous, the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight ourselves in the abundance of peace. The meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. So if I'm just patient and wait, God is going to give me everything. I am going to have wealth and my enemies and my detractors better run for cover because look out, that guy, Mike, he's a Christian. You're about to get served by God himself. We're missing the point. If I have very little and I dine with Christ every evening, I pray and I invite him into uh, my meal to dine with me, how am I not a king? If I pray and have a connection with Christ and I walk with Christ, how am I not a king? I don't believe personally that God is going to give me a golf course. I don't believe that God is going to give me a Ferrari for being meek. I don't believe that. Um, What I do believe though, is that in turning my heart to the Lord and repenting, I free myself from the traps that ensnare others. And that's a really big deal. We will see those that choose a path away from the light, away from the Lord, being cut down by their own folly. It's not God that's gonna have to cut them down. They're gonna do it to themselves by their own poor decisions. So what about the meek inheriting the earth? Um, the, in Greek literature, the word meek actually meant gentle, or soft. So what does that mean? That means that the Holy Spirit fills us when we accept the gift that is being offered. In Genesis, God tells humanity that all of this is yours and you're going to have dominion all over it. Giddy up. It is all yours. If you treat it well and you are kind to it and you don't want more than you need, you will never, ever want you will have plenty. You will have abundance. If we see with eyes focused on the Lord, then we will have all we need with less. So I began by telling you a story of my own folly, you know, uh, alcohol, prescribed medication, and who was I hurting? Who was I hurting? You know, myself most certainly, but who else? I would go out and and people would see me drinking. And when I was going out and drinking, it sent a signal. And that signal is, I'm okay with this, obviously. This is a way that I choose to live. And I think you should be living this way as well. I was smiling and I was laughing, but what people didn't see was me in the morning. And I wasn't smiling and I wasn't laughing. I was feeling a great deal of anxiety. And the reason why I was so anxious is because I was worried that someone else would find out that I had this drinking problem. And I I wasn't coping with it. Um, I was afraid that someone else would find out that I was unworthy and I had this huge issue. 
check this out. I actually wanted to invent, and this is how sad it is, I actually wanted to invent a cover that would literally go on my recycle bin. It would cover the contents of the recycle bin. So when I put it out by the road, people couldn't walk by and say, oh my goodness, Whew, that guy's got a drinking problem. You see, I could just cover it up. It'd be like some kind of recycled plastic and the guy could take it off and throw it in the recycling bin, throw it all away. What a great, wonderful idea. Uh, that's how we often think, isn't it? I mean, we think that if we've got a fear, we can take a drink or we can take a bill. And when we've got shame, we can just put a cover over it. Or we could actually deal with the issue itself. Take it to the foot of the cross. Behind me. Take it to the foot of the cross. Push it there and leave it there. That's what we do. I would like to read 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 7. So I sat uh, with that pill in my hand and I began to pray. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. There I was. I had the pill in my hand. People were lining up to get on the plane. I'd already given up alcohol. I was a Christian at that point. I was back and I took that little pill. No one would notice I was alone. It doesn't even have a smell. My family wasn't with me. Nobody would know. So I took the pill and I stood up and I walked over to the garbage can and I, I threw it away. And the reason why I threw it away was obviously because I wondered if I was, would I be strong enough? Would I be strong enough during that flight if I started to feel fear? I didn't trust myself. So I, I threw it away. It was that moment that uh, I felt that, you know, I could no longer be tempted by drugs and alcohol and I never took another drink and I haven't taken another pill uh, since. Um, let's read Psalm 37, verse uh, 23 and 24. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong for the Lord upholds his hand. Yeah. And Psalm 37 verses 39 and 40. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. It wasn't me, you know, that found the strength. It was God that gave me the strength to take my crutch and put it down. Now, here's a really important thing about a crutch. If you put your crutch down, you've got to tell everybody you know that you have just put this crutch down. So if you place your crutch down on the ground, make sure you tell everybody you know that you have done this. Because what if you stop smoking? In your heart, you know that you have stopped smoking. And 12 hours have gone by and you haven't yet been tempted and you really haven't seen anyone else. And then after that 12 hours, you still haven't told anyone. Someone comes up to you and says, hey man, you want a cigarette? And you're like, yeah, I do. When you light that cigarette, that person can't say, wait a minute, didn't you stop? So one, you got to tell everybody. Two, you got to surround yourself with Christian brothers and sisters that are going to support you in this decision that you're making. Amen, most certainly. When you put down a crutch, make sure you tell people. So my anxiety was the kind that I prayed and I was freed from it. Maybe yours is as well. Maybe that's your kind of anxiety, but God is a healer. And God uses our remarkable frontal lobes and creates some amazing physicians. And I'm, I want to tell you this. Maybe that pill that you take that makes you feel normal is an answered prayer. For me, I could just pray, you know, and get rid of my anxiety. But maybe you've got an issue. And that pill that you take is the very pill that makes you feel 
normal again. Maybe that pill is an answered prayer. And if that is the case, amen, my brother and sister. If you are experiencing anxiety though, and you're coping with it in a way that's causing you shame, you're waking up in the morning and you realize that what you're doing to cope with your anxiety is making you feel worthless and powerless and just shame, it's going to get worse. I'm a man from experience that can tell you that. So take that shame. Leave it at the foot of the cross. Give your anxiety to the Lord. Be healed. And you will most certainly learn to heal others. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah, surpasses all understanding. Oh man, the peace that I felt after I threw that pill away and stopped, I used to be terrified of flying. I'm not anymore. Hey, I don't like turbulence to this day, but you can ask my wife. She'll tell you. Uh, The person who I was before and after giving it all to the foot of the cross is a very different human being. Um, Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus takes our anxiety and turns it into our victory. I want to finish with a prayer. Um, And uh, this prayer was uh, actually written by a Christian counselor. So uh, let me share that with you and have a couple parting words and uh, we'll say deuces. Lord, I come to you and I thank you for drawing near to me when I draw near to you. To think that you are mindful of me, it overwhelms my soul. But Lord, today my spirit is heavy and my body is weak. I cannot bear the weight of this anxiety and panic any longer. I recognize I can't get through this alone. And I pray against the very active enemy who is trying to shake my faith and tear us apart. Help me stand strong in you. Fortify these weary bones and remind me of the truth that this pain and panic will not last forever. It will pass. Fill me with your joy, peace, and perseverance, Father. Restore my soul and break the chains of anxiety and panic that bind me. I trust you with my panic and I know that you have the power to take it all away. But even if you don't, I know I don't have to be a slave to my fear. I can rest in the shadow of your wings and I will rise and overcome by your unwavering strength. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Connect with us, church. You know, you got a prayer request. Do you want to be baptized? Do you want to become a member of Anastasia? Well, then you need to click on connectcard.anastasiachurch.org. Connectcard.anastasiachurch.org. Maybe you need a church family that will help you cope with your anxiety in a very, very healthy fashion. We love and miss you, church, and we will all be together soon. God bless.